Hello, Hello Lincoln, Lincoln Bridge. Bridge. We, we miss you and them. Good morning, Eagle Ridge from the Rosa family. Good morning, Eagle Ridge Church of God, friends and family. We hope this finds you well and being safe. We miss you and my goodness, we just can't wait to see you soon. Good morning. Good morning, Eagle Ridge. Good morning, Eagle Ridge Church of God family and friends. I miss you. Can't wait till we can worship together again, face to face. Like waiting to see Jesus face to face. Have a great Sabbath day. Good morning, Eagle Ridge. My, how we miss your smiling faces and warm hugs on Sunday morning. Can't wait till we all get back together again. Hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Take care. Good morning. My name is Julie Wiseman, Associate Pastor here at Eagle Ridge Church of God in Midland. We have read and heard many reports again this week. One thing I read this week that stood out, together we will get through it. The people of God are holding strong because of who God is. We celebrate this as we join via Facebook or YouTube this morning in worship. I wanted to share a scripture reading from Isaiah 40, beginning with verse 28. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weary or weak. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Let's begin our worship today with prayer. Dear Father, we pause today to thank you for being our everlasting God and creator of all the earth. We celebrate that you are the God of wonders beyond our galaxy and you are the one and true God. You never grow weary. We pray for our loved ones who are hospitalized. Be with each and every one of them today. Surround them with your love. We ask that you forgive us for our weariness. Help us to always remember that you give us power in our weakness. We are asking today that you would help us trust in you with all our heart. As we learned in Proverbs, to not lean on our own understanding, but to acknowledge your ways. We pray for our families today, those who are immediate and those who are extended, those who are near and those who are far away. Help us to all be safe. We pray for our fellow pastors and churches here in Midland as all of us accept the challenge set before us. We pray for our Faith Promise Ministry partner today, Life Clinic. We pray for those who care for our elderly in, re in various capacities, sometimes in the home and sometimes in a residential facility. We pray that you would be with those in those facilities and keep them safe as well. And we pray for our nation this week as we approach the National Day of Prayer on May 7th. Help us to lift up our nation in prayer and ask for your guidance. And then we pray for Pastor Bill as he brings the message in just a few minutes that you would empower him with your strength and that he would bring words to us that will help us all as we move forward to be disciples for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I hope you're having a good start to your Sunday morning. We're into the first, uh, the first of May, and I am wearing short sleeves, uh, which is a miracle for me because if you know me, I'm always cold. But uh, glad to see May here. Um, I've been thinking about uh, our, you know, our focus on the, the the coronavirus and how it seems to to. It seems to demand a lot of our attention, and obviously it's a serious thing, and, and people are getting sick and people are dying, but we're always keeping track of it, of how, it, you know, how it's spreading and the numbers and everything. It seems like every night uh, Robin picks out or pulls out her phone and, and goes through how many are in our county. And, and so we're watching something bad spread. 
for the next few moments, let's just think about watching something life-giving that spreads and kind of turn it around for the next next few minutes. Uh, we've been in a, in a series on Acts, and if you're joining in and you're not a part of our Eagle Ridge family, uh, you're joining in from Beaverton or, or where, wherever you happen to be, uh, we're in a series on Acts, but don't worry, it's, it's not an inside joke. Each sermon kind of stands on its own, even though they're connected. But to give you the, the, the quick overview of what's been happening in this book of Acts, this is after Jesus uh, has, uh, has died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. He's given the marching orders to his people to go make disciples of all nations. And uh, in in the book of Acts, or in the in in the book of Acts, and in the book of Luke, they're both written by Luke. There also is a path, from Judea, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to all the world. And so, what we've seen is in Jerusalem, where it all started, where Jesus. Uh, was resurrected and uh, Pentecost, if you know about that, the Holy Spirit came and many people started following Jesus. It gained traction, this movement, this Jesus movement gained traction. And then, then it, it launched out and, and got momentum and spread through Judea, the surrounding area, into Samaria and a neighboring country. And now we've been seeing it move into the rest of the world into other parts of the world. And actually today we're, we're in that part where it's, it's moving into Europe. We started in that last week. So there's traction, there's momentum, and then now we're seeing mainly Paul and Silas planting churches. People are coming to follow Christ. Churches or fellowships are growing. And then the message spreads from there. So that's so we're, it's, it's planted and spreading. That's kind of what we've been talking about. And uh, like I said, it's moved into Europe, which would be, you know, parts of Macedonia is parts of now Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Greece. So um, it's moving west for the first time. And if in this, the main person, like I said, is Paul, the Apostle Paul and his sidekick Silas. Timothy has come along with them and their times in, the, in, the, in this story where Luke, the writer, is also with them too. But this is considered part of uh, Paul's second missionary journey. And we're going to be looking at chapter 17. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to focus on mainly the first 15 verses. But I really encourage you to read all of chapter 17. And this is from the English Standard Version, chapter 17 of Acts 1 through 15. Let's dive right into it. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia... They, call, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. This is typically the way Paul starts. He finds a synagogue. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it is necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, making some wicked, uh, taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And and when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of, of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned, who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And this is always the attack, where, where they're looking at, uh, the ac at the accusation that they're being, they're, they're subverting Roman authority, and Rome is in charge of basically the whole world at this point. They've conquered all the territory that Paul is going to be going through. Let's continue. And the people, uh, and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. 
the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the, into the Jewish synagogue. Again, this is always the way he starts. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with, with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed that not a, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. And when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command from Silas, for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So we've got a couple different places where Paul is, is going to be teaching. And you hear those phrases, uh, you know, a great many devout Greeks and not, not a few of the leading women in Thessalonica. And we know a church grew there because Paul writes to the church in Thessalon Thessalonica, the, book of, the letter or the book of Thessalonians. And then Berea... He goes there and it says, uh, you know, Jews and Greek women of high standing. And so an, another, another church, another fellowship is planted from which this message can spread. And then Paul goes to Athens. We won't read all the part about Athens, but we'll, we're going to be referring to uh, that also. Now, I want to be upfront. Uh, I'm going to use uh, some planting and growing stories. I am not a farmer. I've never played a farmer on television or on the stage and I don't know very much about it. And if I were a farmer, I would probably starve. And the animals would get loose. So this is coming from my experience as a boy. But um, we, we would plant a vegetable garden and we also had berries. We had black raspberries and red raspberries. We planted these in the backyard, had a nice big backyard. And uh, one year when I was really young, my dad actually let me skip school so we could take the day and put the garden in. That's the way we called it. And so um, we started, you know, we started early in the morning uh, preparing the soil, you know, at, you know, I was too young to use the tiller because, you know, that's kind of like riding a, a bronco. I mean, it's b pitching all over and some of it needed to be sod busted out. Other, you know, was maybe area that we had used to grow things before. So tilled it up. Then we got the hoe and, you know, you bust up the clodge and you smooth it out. So it's, it's, it's uh, ready to go. And, you know, we would even... Uh, use the hoe to make a line to, to plant the seeds, depending on what we were planting. Sometimes I remember my dad would actually put a stake on one end and a, and a um, piece of uh, cord or something like that or twine to give a line so that the, the, the lines, the, the rows that we were planting in would be, there would be enough space in between them and they would be relatively straight. So we did all this stuff to prepare the, the soil so that we could have a, uh, have a good harvest and have lots of vegetables and berries and things uh, from our garden. Now, the, the preparing the soil wasn't the fun part for a kid. You know, I even had to think through, I can't remember all that we did. I, we probably put fertilizer in there. I, I don't know, because that wasn't the interesting part to me. I was happy to miss school and it was fun being with my dad, but um, the, the really fun part is watching, you know, watching the things grow you know we you, you would run out to uh, to see if you saw anything green popping up that was fun and then even the picking stuff was even more fun than that where we would go out and you would see actually things growing and you would pick them and then you know wash off the carrots and the radishes we always had carrots and radishes and tomatoes and stuff like that and then um also the raspberries now the raspberries, we had, we had uh, wire going above them so that they could grow up and kind of twist around it because they, they do spread. And the raspberries actually spread to the fence between our, our property and the farm field. And they moved down there and really spread. And so that was fun, picking them, picking all those things. The most fun was eating, particularly um, you know, some of the vegetables I liked. 
But, you know, that's what your mom makes you eat. But the berries were amazing. And we always had a bowl of them, fresh, black and red. Mom would make some pies that were amazing. And we would always have a bowl of them. And so in the morning, you throw those on top of cereal, amazing. Bowl of vanilla ice cream or whatever flavor, put some of those fresh raspberries on the top, great. You know, the, the picking was pick one, put it in the basket, pick one, eat it. Pick one, go. And then you have to watch out for the thorns because those are there. So the, the, the preparing the soil was really important, but it really wasn't the fun part. Now, kind of like that with, with the Bible and the stories. We love the stories of how people of lives have been transformed, that the churches are growing in Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down in fire, and, and many people believe, and there's all these exciting things, and miracles are going. But what happened to prepare for all of that? What, what was I got under the surface or behind the scenes? It's the same with Jesus. He teaches the crowds and does miracles and in the stories in the New Testament. Uh, and then, you know, we, we, we focus on that, but how was Jesus operating? What was, what was he doing? What was under, how was he preparing the soil for this harvest, the planting, and then the spreading? Because it's, it's got to spread all around the world. The, one of the questions is, was Jesus all inspiration and power, or was he also strategic and purposeful in preparing the soil? What was, how, was he, how was he operating? Who was he talking to in the different settings? Was what Jesus taught or how Jesus operated more important? Think about that for a second. Are, are his methods and him being purposeful kind of secondary to the words and, and the, the miracles and the things he did. I'm going to contend that what he did to prepare the soil is every bit as inspired as the words and the miracles that he did. The process of preparing the soil for a good harvest is not that exciting. But if you don't prep, if you don't purposeful, if we didn't do all those things before our garden, we weren't going to have a good harvest and we weren't going to have the things that, that, that we wanted to eat afterwards. Yeah, I did a similar thing a while back with the book of John. I was challenged to read through it and really try to focus on how Jesus was operating and how he was setting up this movement that was going to go across the world and not get fixated on the miracles in his words, believing that Jesus was purposeful that there was an anointing on his strategy as well as the words and the miracles. So trying not to focus on the shiny objects, but to see behind, under the surface what Jesus was doing to set this movement up. He was just setting up a disciple-making movement where disciples make disciples, fellowships are planted, it spreads all over the world. So I believe his strategy is the same. It was inspired like his words. Now, I also believe it's the same with Paul. We want to look at his, what he, how he was operating, how he was preparing the soil, the things that aren't as flashy, but, but prepared for the harvest, the planting and the harvest. That's what I want to do in the next few minutes with this, these stories in chapter 17. So this is all about preparing the soil for planting that will spread. You see how that worked? Preparing the soil for planting for the purpose of it spreading. Like those raspberries, we planted them and they just took off and they were down the, the fence row and we had more than we ever started with. And it was amazing. Now, we talked about last week, to fill you in if you weren't there, uh, weren't with us last week, that Paul is always looking for what we call a bridgehead. A bridgehead is a military term where it's a safe place behind enemy lines from which you can advance or attack. Now, you know, it's, there's always a little issue with using a military term, but Paul always found a place where he could land, typically the synagogues, where it was safe, where there was a good chance that the, the, that the message of Jesus would at least get a hearing. And that was the bridgehead. And then when he would go to these synagogues, then he would also look for what we refer to as the person of peace, the person that God has prepared to hear. The Holy Spirit's already working in their life and drawing them to Jesus. 
So he finds these synagogues, and within that he tries to find the persons that God is already preparing. You see how that works? So Paul is, that, that's a part of how Paul's strategy of preparing the soil is kind of based on those two things. But let's look. He, he gave, gives a clear path of how he's going to do this. So let's figure out his strategy. Look back at verse 2. We're going to go over these few verses uh, numer numerous times. And Paul went in, and as his custom, on three Sabbath days, and he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. This is the synagogue, the bridgehead, the, the entry point into the community, where the, the message could get uh, a, a fair hearing, and then where he's going to look for those persons of peace. And that, that word, re word reasoning, that comes to the, the, this first point is, a Jesus-centered discussion. That's where Paul is going to have a Jesus-centered uh, discussion. That word reasoned is to converse, discourse, discourse with one, argue, or discuss. There's back and forth, okay? He's going into the synagogue, and, and he's, he's having these discussions. Now, this verse, dialogame, dialogue, get it? The Greek word is used 10 times from this point on. So this is, this is a part of Paul's strategy. It's not a, just about him standing up and talking. It, 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 we believe that it was some part of a combination of giving an address, telling some things about Jesus, telling the story of Jesus, using scripture, but yet allowing for discussion and debate as a result of the proclamation. He says some things and then they start kicking it around. That's what we do in our elders meeting in our, in our church. For instance, I, brand, I brought an idea that, uh, uh, that I wanted to lead in a direction uh, with our church, and it was to, to add uh, Tammy Naffy to our staff uh, as our director of mobilization. She's helping people get mobilized to be sent to, to uh, serve, to minister, to make disciples. That's, that's what her... So I presented this idea and then they kicked it around with me and helped take the the edges off and that kind of thing but like paul i led the discussion but there was back and forth paul is landing this idea about jesus in a place that might be fertile where something could get planted that the that from that point can spread See, there's very clear data on the fact that simply sitting and listening has a very low retention rate. We don't, we don't, the, the, the concepts don't, we don't capture them and they become really a part of our life. There's much better retention rate if we are interacting with the idea, with this new idea. We're reflecting upon it. We're, we're talking about it. See, that is the inherent problem with this setting, whether it's in person or uh, through the internet like we're doing now. The inherent problem with only listening to a sermon once a week is that there's low retention. It's just theory. But Paul gave an opportunity in this dialogue discussion where he presented some things, but then they, they were kicking it around. See, this demanded listening to where the people were coming from. Paul was... was, was was hearing their perspective when they were kicking this around. You know, there were Jews. They had a different perspective. In the synagogue, there were Greek people with more of a Greek background who weren't Jews, who were God-believers, God-fearers, it says. And they were there. They, they had a different perspective. There are people that are coming at this from a perspective of, of hurt and fear, and, and they've been marginalized in the past, or or they've had a superiority complex in the past about spiritual things. They're, they're coming from a different... Paul gets a chance to hear this. Now, later on in the chapter when he's in Athens, this is a verse from that. Uh, I think it says 17.7. Seven, seven. It should actually be 17, verse 17. That was my mistake. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and, devout, and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So there's that same word, reasoning, that's going to be used eight more times throughout the book of Acts. It's possible that he was plying his trade as a tent maker or a tent repairer in the, the marketplace for dialogame, for dialogue and presenting some things about Jesus and kicking it around with people. 
what does this type of communication give Paul the opportunity to, to discover? Well, in a dialogue, he gets the opportunity to discover who that person of peace might be because they're leaning in, they're listening, they're engaging, they're not giving body language that says, I'm not into this. Now, I've seen this happen numerous times at um, our coffee shop uh, that we hope will be re reopening soon in the Midland Mall uh, called Cultivate. Cultivating life-changing uh, life relationships over a cup. That's the, that's the byline of it. But I've seen people like Pete Deal and Deb Yates and, and Matt Chesney interacting with people and having discussions that are Jesus-centered and there's some back and forth. They're learning about this person, getting to know them. And there's also maybe other people sitting around their tables that are kind of, kind of listening. That's that's what the the a Jesus-centered dialogue ha, uh, can can look like today, where we're not mending a tent in a marketplace or going to a synagogue, because that's that's not going to work for us. So you have to look below the surface. And, and not just at the message, but how Paul operated in order to plant in a way that it will spread. Let's keep going. We'll read that again. And Paul went in, as was his custom, on three Sabbath days. He reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining. This is the next part of his strategy. Preparing the soil for planting the spreads is about helping them understand the message. That's that word explaining that that greek word literally means to open up in in luke 24 32 when jesus is, is has been resurrected he's walking down the road with some of his guys and they say after the fact were not your hearts burning when he opened the scriptures that's the explaining, the un helping somebody understand. They didn't even know it was Jesus at that point, but, but he, they said he opened up the scriptures. You are literally explaining what Jesus did and what it means. You're, in, in, our, in our context, in a, in a post-Christian world, we literally are opening something that is closed. In America, this is, you know, we're uh, the first generation that will have no, really no contact or concept of church. And so the Bible is a closed book. It has to be opened, and that means explaining it. See, uh, way back in the, in the, the Middle Ages or wh whatever, it, it, when, when the Bible was, uh, had been translated from its original language of Hebrew and Greek into Latin, well, all that meant was only really educated people could read it, and they had to tell everybody else what was in it. But the book became open when it was written in languages like German and English and French and whatever. Then, then the book was open to regular people. That's what explaining, making something that was closed is now open, and I can understand it. Now, later in, in the story in Athens, and you can, like I said, I can challenge you to read that, there was a place called the Areopagus, and that's where uh, the, 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 the Greeks in Athens, to me, it sounds like they were a little full of themselves. They liked to, to get around and just debate stuff, the newest idea, and the Areopagus is where a bunch of those people, you know, philosophers and, and, and stuff like that would come. And so they had been hearing from Paul, and they invited him to come, um, come to the Areopagus and share about this new thing, this new Jesus thing, because they were all about the next new idea. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So he starts to explain and open up what was closed, and he tells them about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, some of these people were just way too smart for that. So they were like, resurrection, nah. Okay, we, this was really interesting, but I'm done now. The, the book became closed. But there were some people that followed Paul out of that meeting who wanted to know more, and they became followers of Christ. For them, Paul continues to open up and explain the story. But many of them, it, it closed immediately. The idea of something opening, that's 
helping them understand the message. Let's let's keep adding layers to this. He said he went into the, as it was his custom, three Sabbaths, reasoned, explained, and it says, and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and, ri and rise from the dead. See, if there's a Jesus-centered discussion and they're kicking stuff around and he's explaining what, what happened and what it means and, and the way of salvation, doesn't it stand to reason that some folks are going to have some questions? That something new has just been opened up to them? They're going to have some questions and maybe even a little pushback. Well, how can that be? So to prepare a soil for planting that will spread, Paul was answering questions and responding to objections. That's the, the logical next step. And that's what this word prove means. It means to give evidence for. Okay, he says these things about Jesus. Well, here's from the scriptures, and probably from reason. Here's, here's why th this, this makes sense. Here's how I'm answering your questions. Now, for the Jews, one of the main objections would be, the Messiah can't die a humiliating death. That doesn't register with them. He's supposed to be a triumphant king. Jesus was a different kind of king. So, so that, need to be, that, that needed to be uh, explained a little deeper, and he needed to respond to those questions. The Greeks, obviously, they have a problem with a resurrection. Dead people don't raise from the dead, okay? Maybe there's a soul or something like that. The Greeks like to separate the physical from the spiritual. Soul floats off, body's dead. So they would have had questions about this. So Paul is re responding to is going to be responding to those questions and objections, and he's going to be answering them. We so, you know, I'm not Paul. Here's one thing I've heard over 30 years of ministry, over and over again. I don't know enough to do this. Problem is when you say when we say I don't know enough, and then we say it two years later, <laughs> and we didn't do anything in the between to learn and allow God to renew our minds and, and, and help us, then we're kind of stuck. And there's no, there's no remedy for the situation. I know, remember a number of years ago, there was a young man who, who wanted to, to get together with me and talk about uh, relationship with Christ and, and um, even was a part of a, a group for a short time. Just what we kept bumping up against is he would not read the Bible. And so finally, both of those situations fizzled out. And it was always, I don't know enough. I, you know, I, I wasn't raised in this. These people started from nothing. Most of them weren't like Paul, who was brilliant, who was well-trained and educated. And yet, there's more people not like Paul than are like Paul that caused this thing to be spread in, uh, all over the world to where it eventually got to Europe and got to us. Let's let's keep let's keep let's lay a, add another layer. There's you know there's the Jesus centered discussion. There's there's answering uh, the the questions. There's there's uh, all of this stuff. Then then I'm not going to read the whole thing again to you. But we get to explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Christ means Messiah. King, Son of God. He's the one. So, in preparing something to be planted that can spread, it's about proclaiming the gospel or the good news. This is the line in the sand. We've, dis we've, we've kicked it around. I've answered some of your questions, but this is the bottom line. This is how it is. This is who Jesus is, and this is what he did. We... we, we these are, these are parts of the thing that you can't take out or it, it just doesn't exist anymore. These are the sets of facts that are, about, that are true about Jesus. The evidence concerning Jesus has to come to a point where we lay down the facts. And that's what Paul's doing. That's proclaiming. Paul states the facts in his letter to the, to the Corinthian church. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Now, the way we discuss this and the way I think is helpful is 
the gospel, those non-negotiables are four things. Several of them are in this scripture, and if you read Mark 8 and some other patches, passages, you get the whole idea. But there are four non-negotiables that are declarative statements of the gospel, the good news that saves. And that is the, the, the kingdom. There are four words, kingdom, Christ, death, and resurrection. Jesus came to announce the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the restoration of God's rule or authority over all things. It begins with him. Then he is the, the Christ. He is the king. He is God in a human body. But he also died, really died, and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures on the third day. Paul is saying that those, those things are central. That's, that's what it's all about. So he's going to proclaim some things. We've been discussing, we've been answering, now I'm going to proclaim some things. This, this, is, this is the bottom line. See, are you seeing that we have to look below the surface? If, we're going to, if something is going to be planted in a way that it will spread? See, but there's more. We're going to go back to that scripture again. With reasoning, explaining, proving, proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ. See, Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. That was a designation. It means, like I said, King, Messiah, Son of God, God in human flesh. That's, that's what the Christ means. Then it says, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. So now we've got persuading and joined. See, we're, we're, we're looking below the surface. We're seeing how uh, this movement was, the, the strategy, the purposefulness of how he operated, how Jesus operated, and now how Paul operates for this movement to continue. Is it his strategy? Is his strategy as inspired as his teaching? Isn't it interesting that when we're going through this list of things that he, that his strategy, very little said is said about what he said when he was reasoning, explaining, proving. The proclamation is pretty clear. But it, Luke doesn't go into all the detail. He just he gives us the path. But here's where it comes into that from the scriptures quote. If you remember, if you, if you heard that, from the scriptures. This is the glue that holds the whole process together, is the scriptures. This isn't Paul's just opinion. He's bringing the the Old Testament prophets and law that, that, that prepared the way for Jesus and pointed toward Jesus and told him who he was going to be and what he was going to do. That brings us to the Bereans. The, the, well, that part that we read at the beginning that happened in Berea when he got chased out of Thessalonica. Listen to this again, 11 and 12. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They went right back to the scriptures to see if Paul was full of it or whether he was really saying the truth. Many of them therefore believed and not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So the Bereans were more noble because they approached it in a childlike way. What does that mean? Well, it, it means they understood that they were needy, that they were missing something. And this sounded like what they were missing in the story. And so they really dug into it. Here's how Paul describes this, this whole thing of the importance of Scripture to his, his uh, protege, his apprentice, Timothy, who's on this trip with him. Listen to this. This is from 2 Timothy, the letter of 2 Timothy. But you must remain faithful to the, uh, to the things you have been taught. You know they are true. For you know uh, you can, excuse me, for you know you can trust those who taught you. He was taught by his... his uh, his mom and his aunt, I think, they, 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 were, they taught him the Old Testament scriptures. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have, been, they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus. You knew these stories, and it prepared you to, to receive and follow Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do uh, to do what is right. And this is really important. 
God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The law and the prophets prepared, and those stories prepared, uh, prepared Timothy to accept Christ. Can you see that, that this isn't about maturity, it's about mission? God uses all that stuff to make us really smart. No, it doesn't say that. To make us mature, whatever that means. It's to equip the people to do every good work. See, we need to move from a focus on this nebulous maturity, you know, what does that really mean, to mission. The person has got it when they're joining Jesus' mission. Maturity doesn't necessarily, as we, as we view it in America, doesn't necessarily demand planting and spreading, but mission does. It's all about the mission of Jesus Christ. See, Paul is preparing the soil. Do you see that? So that it's what's planted can spread. It's under the surface. It's not as flashy as some of the other things, but he's creating a path here. But the, here, here's the next part. Uh, there's discussing and there's, uh, there's all those different parts we went through and then the Holy Spirit pers persuades and allows for the step of faith. The Holy Spirit comes, who's been there all along is the one who does the persuading and allows the person to have the courage and the ability to take that first step. Persuaded is the mind being changed. Joined is the action of following. You see how those two things go together? And that's where we get the next part of the gospel. You've got those four declaratives that they're just true. Kingdom, Christ, death, resurrection. And now the persuading part and the step of faith is really about the three, the three imperatives or challenges. Repent, follow, and believe. Repent, I was going this direction towards all of these priorities. I'm putting a foot in the ground, I'm changing and following Christ. That's repent. Repent of my sin, repent of my walking the wrong direction. Then following, actually following him, what he says. And then believe. Believe is not about intellectual assent. It is to, be, to believe something enough to trust in it. That it will hold you up. I don't know if you've ever had rehab on a leg or an injury. I know a few years ago, Robin blew up her ankle. It was a long rehab. Uh, if you've had to have a rehab leg, the muscles need strengthening. The tendons need to know, this is how we, far we stretch, not this far. And they have to be uh, repaired, and, and the muscles and the, and the actual joint and bone needs to get lubricated and to get moving around again. And, and all that stuff has to work. All that is great, but you still have to take a step, right? All that rehab is fine, but at some point, you're going to have to put weight on it and trust that it's going to hold you. Now, we step all the time, and we, don't, we take steps all the time, and it, it, we don't even think about it. But when you've had an injury, you think about it. it, it, it yeah, I've had all this rehab that is, persuades me to believe that, that when I step, it will hold me up. But I still have to take that step and trust that those ligaments, that joint, those bones, those muscles, that they will be able to hold me. And then I can join the rest of the world that's walking and moving through their life. Listen to this from the, the, the part of the story in Athens. Now, when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some mocked. We talked about that. But others said, we will hear you about this. Uh, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, and among them were Dionysius and Areopagite, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So some people were persuaded and took the step of faith that when all those other people are mocking, they said, no, Paul, we want to hear more, and they followed him. That's, that's, that's repentance, that's trust and belief, and that's literally physically following him. Look at the path. Here it is. There's reasoning, there's explaining, there's proving, there's proclamation, there's persuading and joining. 
So how do we begin to join that process? If you're, if you're a Christ follower, if, you've, um, if you have stepped out on that foot and trusted it, you've stepped out and trusted Christ and followed him, then how do you join that? Obviously, if you aren't a Christ follower, I hope that you will, you will do like the Bereans and lean in and find out more. Maybe listen to the next few sermons going through the book of Acts, read the book of Mark, whatever. But we want to be action-oriented. That's to teach them to obey. That's what we're trying to do in a sermon, even though it's not the ideal situation because there's no back and forth. That's why we do our small groups, which we call bridge groups, where the theory can then become something that I reflect upon with real people. And dialogame. <laughs> discussion can happen. But here's some possible steps of obedience. Research the answer to one of their questions. People who uh, maybe are moving toward Christ might be that person of peace that have questions that, uh, that they're hearing about Jesus. Instead of worrying about that I don't know enough, think about some of the questions they have and, and go find the answers. There's plenty of tools to go find the answers. It's just, about, it's just about making the effort. And God will reward our diving into the scriptures. Here's a couple of them I have uh, down on your notes. Uh, and uh, it'll be on the screen, biblegateway.com. Just go, it's got all kinds of ways to search words, books of the Bible, ideas. You wanna know about faith, put in faith. And you'll get a bunch of scriptures and you can, you can dig in. Somebody's got a question about uh, the resurrection. How can that be? You can do a search on that. You go find it. See, many cases, if you're part of Eagle Ridge, I've said this before, so many times this role is overvalued in the idea of planting and spreading the gospel. And your role as a person, working, going to school, wherever you are, is consistently undervalued. Just go find the answers. They're there. Dig into it. Another one is blueletterbible.com. And it'll even tell you how to pronounce some of these words that I'm butchering today. A little button at the top. But you can dig in and find out. That's Blue Letter Bible is where I was going through and, and found out that 10 different times Paul used that word reasoned. I'm not that smart. I had to go find that. So I'm going to challenge you to, to do some research. Here's some other resources that might be helpful. This is something we're using in the, book, in the study of the book of Acts. This is a little journal, and it is from Crossways, scriptural journal of the book of Acts. It's got a page with the scriptures, and then it's got a journal page all through. Here's another one that'll help you with some of the answers. We've got two, we've got, this is uh, the life book of the book of Mark, and there's also, the Gideons put this out, there's also one, I think is the book of John. But it's got a dialogue in the margins of people asking questions who, who aren't believers. And so you can get an idea of what, what questions people are asking. This is another one that, that we have a bunch of here at Eagle Ridge, New Believers Bible. It's got questions in the back, and, or actually in the front, to help you lead through some of the basic beliefs and questions that people have. It's a great resource, it's just the New Testament. I'm really old, so pretty hard to see. But you with young eyes or, a, or some readers. And then if you have a Bible, this is a great Bible if you want a paper Bible, the three-story Bible. It's got all kinds of dialogue running through it and answering of questions that people have all spread out through, and there's even a, a, what we call a concordance in the back that helps you find key words. There's, there's, so be a Berean, go find out, because that's how something that can plant can be, and that's something that we can do. Don't be that person that two or three years from the, down the road is still saying the same things about, I just don't know enough. Do something, small steps, Small changes, turns in life can have a huge impact. And this is one of them. Just start. Don't worry about that the end of the story. Just start. Here's another thing you can do is you can memorize uh, our gospel definition. 
And this is where we kind of took the, the, those seven things, those seven key aspects, the four declaratives and the three imperatives, the facts, and then here's how we respond to the facts. And we um, wrote them together kind of in a, in a story. And that's something that you, that you can that you can read and memorize. So I challenge somebody to memorize it. You know, this is this is this is how it goes. The kingdom of God has been ushered in through Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is Christ, the King, God in a human body. This Jesus suffered and died on the cross, and on the third day was resurrected according to the scriptures. Through Jesus' sacrificial death and God's grace, the separation between people and their Creator was bridged. Therefore, anyone who repents of their sin and believes the good news or gospel and demonstrates this belief by following Jesus, God rescues. It is only through the Holy Spirit that we are able to live this new life as Jesus' disciples. When King Jesus returns, as he promised on the day of judgment, anyone who is following him will enter into God's eternal kingdom. If you were to memorize that, the path, you would always have something to dialogue about with people. Here's the last thing. Maybe you want to just write your story. What I mean by that is how you came to take that step and trust your life to Christ, if you're a Christ follower. And then some, you know, at the top of the paper, before and then after. And look at the, the things that God has taught you, the experiences you had where you've grown and learned and, and become the person that you are and who you're becoming. So maybe it might be just to write out your story because that's something that's, that's yours. My story is mine. And, and when I get to share it and it overlaps with Jesus' story and overlaps with that friend's story who I'm sharing with, then something exciting can happen. Well, I, I hope that you'll... you'll Really take that step and trust that, 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 that leg that you're not sure is strong enough and take one of these steps toward joining Paul in his, his pattern that is absolutely as authoritative as the things he taught about Jesus, the way he operated. Something that gets planted has the opportunity to spread. It's, it's below the surface. It's not as fun as, as the picking and the eating and the consuming, but it's every bit as inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that you're doing in the world, that your kingdom is coming on earth as it is in heaven. We see signs of that. And Father, I just ask that, that you would continue to bless uh, the people that are hearing this and their families. You would keep them safe, that that, uh, that this, um, this lockdown will be over soon and there will be a... Um, a vaccine or whatever and, and we can we can move forward and um, that there will be an answer for this coronavirus and that uh, that people will be able to stop dying from it so father we just ask that you would uh, do what you promise that when your truth is sent out it will not return before it accomplishes the purpose you sent it for in jesus name we pray amen have a blessed rest of your Sunday and a great week next week. Hopefully we'll see you next Sunday.